Welcome everybody to Drive 2014. My name is Matt Barker. I'm the room host here for today and tomorrow. If you need anything at Drive, come see me, come see one of the room hosts uh, or some of the admins. Um, how many of you enjoyed the, the we're, in, we're in an hour so far to Drive 2014. How many of you enjoyed it so far? One hour, it's great. <laughs> So far, so good. So far, so good. Uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, Ryan Teeples. Ryan uh, is consulting nonprofit, has been consulting nonprofits and higher education institutions on CRM and related technologies, and recently founded uh, Foundation XRM. Um, so maybe at lunch, check out the uh, the dot com. Uh, with that, let's give Ryan a, a, a big round of applause and a big welcome to Drive. Do I need to wear the mic? Can you all hear me okay? I have a loud voice anyway. It carries, which causes problems in meetings and things like that. But it's really handy for these types of situations. Uh, before we start, I want to kind of gauge the temperature of the room. Uh, raise your hand if you are in the technology side of uh, your nonprofit or university. Okay, so it appears like most. Raise your hand if you are uh, in the development side of your development office. That, that looks like more than half. Are there people who cross both sides? Is that what I'm seeing there? Oh, I see heads nodding. Okay, so we have a lot of people who will have that cross-functional role of translating the business and development requirements to the technology teams. Okay, good, good. Uh, so this is a good little, this is a, a nice mix for the room. Do you need me to wear the mic? Is that what I'm seeing? Yeah, yeah okay. sorry. We're, we're recording, so. Oh, right. How's that? Hello? It's not working. Okay. All right, great. Well, uh, as he mentioned, my name's Ryan Teeples. I've been doing uh, CRM consulting. I, I actually have been working in nonprofit for about four years now and uh, have worked on multiple implementations of CRM of related technologies in that space and uh, recently founded a company called Foundation XRM, which you'll kind of see a little bit, oh, there we go, which you'll hear a little bit about, and I'll show you at the end uh, a demonstration of our product and uh, talk to you a little bit about that. But I want to focus today on how uh, the technology for donor and alumni management and just CRM in general has changed and how that affects you uh, in your development offices and in your uh, university technology groups. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Uh, the first question I'll ask is, what is CRM? Uh, that seems so simple, but I'm going to be using that term today, but I want to make sure we're all clear, because I've walked into lots of nonprofits and talked about CRM and been said, wait, 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 can you please tell me what CRM means? Does everybody in the room, raise your hand if you know what I mean when I say CRM. Okay, not enough hands, so let me just explain real quick. In the business world, CRM is customer relationship management. It's, it's the discipline and the technology for managing the relationships with your customers. It's pretty straightforward in that regard. In the nonprofit and in the fundraising space, we kind of turn it on its head a little bit and, and call it constituent relationship management. The functions are different than customer relationship management, but the principle is the same. There's an individual who, has a, who is a breathing, living human being who might work for an organization or might be part of a larger organization but there is a relationship to be cultivated there and in order for that relationship to be cultivated there needs to be some sort of way to track the, the interactions that you have with, that, with those people in those organizations. So at its core the principle is the same. So when I say CRM today I'm either referring to the technology or referring to the discipline of constituent relationship management. Uh, for, for the technology purposes, when I refer to it as a technology, here's what, I'm, here's what I mean today. Uh, it's a solution for managing the relationships and data which drive fundraising success. Now there's a key distinction there. Uh, if your CRM solution, if your donor and alumni management solution is not driving fundraising success, then it's being executed wrong and there needs to be some changes. And the good news is the technology environment has rapidly evolved over the last uh, five to ten years that those shouldn't be problems anymore and we can talk about those and, and help you understand. Uh, let's talk quickly about the CRM market history. Uh oh, I got some bullet points out of order. Uh, in the 1980s, you had these terminal workstation databases. How many of you are still operating on a terminal workstation database? Don't be ashamed, it's okay, raise your hand. We have one, Brit, one person who's not lying in the front of the room. 
Um, I'm working with a customer right now who's converting from an AS400 green screen application. That thing is blazing fast and they have they have uh, customized it to the nth degree. That thing does things that it was never intended to do, but it's quite beautiful in some ways. But they can't find anybody to develop on it, can't find uh, anybody who's willing to work with it. They have employees quit simply because they don't want to learn this new technology. It can be a real challenge. Those solutions were great at the time. They, like I said, they were blazing fast and they collected a lot of information, but they were primarily databases. They were a window into a database. They didn't provide a lot of functionality or a lot of outputs back out aside from some basic reporting. In the 19 90s you got to what what I call the black box software market where you have these closed source solutions that are not customizable. Does everybody know what I mean when I say that? Uh, raise your hand if you have a closed non-configurable system today. Maybe you don't know what, Mo, what I mean because more of you should have raised your hand. Uh, in, in the general CRM industry uh, there were solutions like Siebel and uh, PeopleSoft and I'm sure many of you probably still have PeopleSoft in your universities or nonprofits today. But these solutions were delivered to the customer as they are and if you want to make changes you write big checks to Deloitte and Touche and Capgemini and, and uh, groups like that. Uh, to a large extent, that's, that's still part of the marketplace today, but there are some changes that have happened that are important to know. In the, in the 2000s, configuration and configurable software applications became very uh, prominent. So the ability to not just be stuck with the software as it's delivered, but have the ability to change it a little bit. Uh, and in, in addition to that, you also have the, the hosting model starts to emerge. Um, Salesforce.com really turned the market on its head by saying, we're going to deliver you a software application, but you can change it, you can configure it. And then beyond Beyond that, as we look at it today, we, we are moving toward what are called platforms. And you notice I use that word at the, la, the, at the end of that sentence, these solution platforms. Not only are they just focused on a little bit of configuration through what, you, what we call an SDK or software development kit, they are configurable by the end user, so you empower the end user with more ability to configure the system and make changes and, and use the system in the way that each individual role wants to use the system. But also, the actual platforms, the actual technology is customized and extensible. No longer, uh, if, your, if your core function is donor, is donor management, but you have, uh, a, event management's a bad example, let's say that you want to do uh, alumni group management as a function, a platform allows you to do that under the same technology without having to go out and buy a separate solution. And that's how the industry has evolved. And again, Salesforce was a leading driver in that. Uh, Microsoft jumped on very quickly. There are still solutions out there that operate in this 1990s environment, uh, in the, business, in the uh, business CRM space as well as the nonprofit CRM space. But that world is evolving and it's changing and that means good things to you uh, as, as people who are on the technology and on the business side and we'll talk a little bit about why as we move along. Here's one of those green screen applications. Raise your hand if your development system looks like that. No? Okay, there's one hand in the back. That's good. Uh, you see this one is kind of like the, the 1990s Windows 3 or Windows 98 kind of look. Raise your hand if your system looks like that. Okay. What do the rest of your systems look like? Oracle Forms. Oh, Oracle Forms. Okay. That, that's a good one. Okay. We'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> so here's, uh, many people become confused when I start talking about platforms and, tar and start talking about software applications. So I want to make sure that we understand the difference because there are clear distinctions that need to be made. The first is that uh, a, soft a software application is just something that you use to perform a certain set of functions and uh, th those functions are typically finite. What are software applications we use every day? Excel is a very common one. What else? Google, yep, Google is a web-based application. Yep, these are all applications that we use, but they give us a finite set of functions. Um, it's always amazing to me when I go into technology organizations and they've decided to build something from scratch. Uh, and I always say, well, how about word processor? Did you build a new word processor? And they say, well, why would we do that? We have word. Well, exactly. Why did you build this other thing that there are solutions out there for? The, but there are software solutions that we use every single day, but, they're so, but they're, their functions are finite. They're fairly limited. You can't make Word into, a, uh, into PowerPoint. You, you really can't do it. You can't make Word. Well, you can make Word into Excel, sort of, if you embed an Excel object. But, so bad example, but you can't make one software application do something it wasn't designed to do. That's, that's really the key to a software application is it's finite. A platform 
may include applications as part of the platform, but it's built upon a framework that can then be extended, customized, integrated to, uh, configured, and it can be made to do, you know, to some extent, almost anything. Does anybody know, have an example of a platform? So Facebook is sort of is a platform for developers. Yes, to a, to a large extent, you can use it to host your company website if you want. You can build a social network around it. You can use it for internal collaboration. So to that extent, yes, Facebook would be a platform. The problem is everybody knows Facebook as an application in this room. Uh, so it's it's both an application and a platform. Who had a thought in the back? Example. Yeah, Salesforce is, is definitely a platform. Google Drive. Uh, Google Drive, I'm not familiar enough with Google Drive to know whether it's a platform or not, but I believe that they have some developer tools that sit on top of it that allow you to use it for, uh, for a myriad of things. Yeah. So these are all platforms. They give you a framework and say, here is a basis of technology. There are applications that live on top of it. So for Facebook, the application that lives on top of the platform is the Facebook website that you go to. But beyond that, you can build it, develop on it, configure it to do lots of different things. Okay, those are the key distinctions. So that in mind, how many of you feel like your uh, donor management solution today is a an application only? Okay, I, there, there's still a lot of tentative hands. I, how many of you feel like it's a platform today? Okay, less hands, but less tentative. Okay, that's good. So the reason you're tentative, and this is the reaction I get every time I ask this question, is because most people, it's very, there's not a clear line in the sand between what those two things are. Uh, most of your software applications allow you to make some configuration changes, but typically they don't go beyond the finite set of tools or finite set of purposes or functions that the software is delivered for. A platform is designed to allow you to do anything. So for, for example, um, I worked with a a university who is uh, using a, a platform for their donor alumni management system, but their PR department is also using it to manage media contacts. Okay, those are two very separate functions that would not typically be done by a single piece of software. But a platform allows you to extend beyond that and allows you to do things that you normally wouldn't do. Now, I'm not advocating that, that that's the right thing to do for every organization. I'm just showing that there can be very different functions that can go on between the two, and that extensible platform enables that. How many of you have uh, processes and software systems that exist outside of your donor system to perform a function that your donor system just doesn't do. Okay, every hand in the room goes up. A platform would allow you to take all of those processes or most of those processes and make them part of the core application that you work within. Okay, now does everybody kind of understand the difference? Okay, this is very difficult to, to uh, explain until you start to get into the industry and, and start to look at it. What does it mean for fundraising, uh, for fundraising organizations? The first thing is, how many of you um, have to feel like you frequently change your business processes to adapt to a technology? How many of you feel like you've been able to adapt your te a technology to meet the need to meet your uh, unique business process? Okay, so it's kind of a blend in between, that's good. The idea is that a platform doesn't limit you to being forced to use the, either the semantic language or, the, or whatever processes are put in place by the de designers of the software, you're not bound by those. Instead, you can go outside of them. Does anybody have an example that they, they think they know what I'm talking about? How many of you have a multi-stage donor prospect management uh, process? Okay. How many of you have a two-stage process? How about a three-stage process? Okay. How about a four-stage process? Okay. Five-stage process? Where did the rest of you go? Six-stage process? Okay, so we're up to six, seven-stage process. So oh, there's some seven, okay. Do we have anybody that has an eight-stage process? Nine? Okay, so we've run the gamut from two-stage prospect management processes to eight-stage management processes, or prospect management process. Though that's a very clear gap. If you buy a software solution that is not configurable into multiple stages, then you have to change your prospect management process to match the number of stages that are in the solution that you bought. With a platform, it doesn't matter. You could have a 50-stage process if you want. I would not recommend it. 
But I'm sure there are some people who would, if left to their own devices, would come up with that. But the platform allows you to, to extend, to take, that's a great example of something that the, a platform allows you to, uh, you're not forced to take your business process that you've developed over the years and change it to match what the software de designer thinks is best. Instead, you can, you can, ad you can adapt. <coughs> Uh, did anybody have any thought? Feel free to interrupt if you have questions or have any thoughts about that. Any, did, is there anybody who's not clear on that that wants to ask a follow-up question? Okay. Uh, next is keep your own semantics. Uh, how many of you call your donors donors in your system? How many of you call them constituents? Okay. How many of you have a different name for them? Okay, well at least we're kind of down to two. Um, how many of you call your prospect management process, uh, well, we know that there are multiple stages, so everybody's gonna have a different name for every stage. Uh, there, there's, a semant there's a fairly common semantic language across uh, the fundraising industry, but there are some places where, they can, where those semantics can vary drastically. The one place I see it is uh, what people call their proposals, or their asks, or their initiatives, or their opportunities, or uh, I've heard probably 50 different names for those things. If you buy a piece of software that doesn't allow you to change those naming conventions, you're stuck. A platform allows you to keep your semantic language across the entire software system so that whatever your organization is familiar with and whatever language you speak culturally, your system can reflect that. You're not forced to change your culture to reflect the language of the software. Um, how many of you have ever had to have gone through a software implementation where you've had to change the culture of your language, change your semantic language to match the software? Okay, yeah, most have. It, was it frustrating? I see heads nodding. It's like pain that no one wants to bring back to the surface of their brain. They've I, I think most people have repressed a lot of those memories. Uh, the next thing is the, is the automation, of processing, proce automation of processes and enabling procedures without development. How many of you feel, uh, how many of, <laughs> how do I ask this question with the mix of people we have in the room? How many of you f are on the technology only side? Okay, how many of you on the technology only side wish that you could enable your, uh, your end users to perform some of the tasks they're constantly asking you to perform on their own? Okay, every hand goes up. How many of you are on the opposite side and are not involved in the technology but are just on the business side? Probably less. How many of you feel like you never can get anything from your Oh. <laughs> I don't even need to ask the rest of the question, right? Okay. What you guys don't realize is you're victims of the same problem, and that's that the software, the, uh, software and fundraising is fairly limited in terms of the things that you can do with it, so you have to develop around it. And it's not designed to empower end users to be able to perform certain functions on their own. A platform kind of takes that and, and turns it on its head and says, look, you give, the, you give the technology team the control to build permissions based on role and, and based on function, but en enable the end users to do so much. We live in an environment where self-service is so pervasive that it's, it's kind of insane when you, take a, when you walk into the office and realize that you can't even change a parameter on a report. When you can go uh, to even the, even Facebook that the gentleman brought up as an example, you can configure that to be customized to your individual needs. Platforms are, are coming into the CRM space and they're changing that mind frame so that you as the end users are empowered, which leaves the developers free to do what they need to do and the technology people free to do what they need to do, which is actually you know the bigger things which drive real improvement in the systems. They're not bogged down running report requests. How many of you, um, when you need to get a report, have to put it in a queue and it can take two, three, four, five days or even weeks to get a report out of the system. Okay. Uh, how many of you can generate a report on demand or ha can generate a custom report on demand or a custom list of names on demand and are not Michelangelo customers? <laughs> Okay, so only a few. So th these are the types of things that platform, the move from software to platform start to enable. The next is extension of the system. Uh, make it do anything that's, that's core to your fundraising or it can be ancillary to your fundraising. How many of you in, how many of you think that you, or how many of you have one system for all of your fundraising activities? Okay, a couple. How many think it's two systems? Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven, 
Okay, good. I've, I've asked that question before and gotten up to 10, in fact, but for, it looks like most of the room is somewhere between 4 and 7. Now, I, I want you to, those of you on the business side, look at your technology partners and say, oh, I can start to see why you don't have, you're not able to process some of those requests. They're managing multiple systems to, do, to perform core functions. When you start to think about an organization that has a donor and alumni management system and then they are for fundraising, then they have a, a alumni group management system, then you've got a recruiting tool potentially or a, a alumni or a career services tool. You might have a different platform for your for your online giving. You might have a different platform for your telefund group. Uh, you start to add those things up and you realize that most organizations have six plus systems to manage their, their core fundraising. That's because software solutions in the past, because they had those limited functions, didn't allow you to do all of the things you needed to do, so you had to buy multiple software systems to kind of fill out the package. The move to platform changes that and allows you to start to think about one system being able to do multiple things. Now, I would never advocate that, they, that it can do all things, but it can start to do multiple things in a single platform that share data. How many of you feel like uh, a lot of your reporting or your data problems are because data exists in multiple systems across Across, across different organizations. Okay, raise those hands high because uh, uh, how many, how, uh, and in many cases those different systems are actually owned and managed by different individuals who may or may not have any incentive to help you get data out of it. There may not be a common join or a common ID. You may not be able to actually match data from one system to another. These are, all, these are problems that every fundraising organization faces and it's because of those software silos that exist. How many of you feel, oh, go ahead. I was just going to ask, but, but don't you think that that will continue with the uh, To a certain extent, but it, won't, it eliminates those data silos because if you can configure a system to do the things that multiple databases used to have to do, then you've at least got the data into one place. And to a certain extent, you're right. You will never eliminate those silos of information because people will be able to customize, but at least it allows the developers to have a little bit more control over that. Or uh, not the developers, but the technology people and the business people who make the joint agreements can have control over what those silos look like. And at least they're sharing a common platform and you gain economies of scale by being able to develop on a single application as opposed to you know five or six different different applications. Any other thoughts? Sorry, I haven't paused and taken a breath. Anybody else have any questions? We'll do a full Q&A at the end. But. Um, integrate all you want. How many of you feel like one of your biggest challenges is integrating uh, one system into another? How many on the technology side feel like the business believes that it should be easy to do that, but it's just not? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's a softball, I know, I know. And how many on the business side think that it should be so, we have the data over here, it should be so easy to match it up with this other data? You can raise your hands. I mean, I, I think that all the time too, and I understand the technology side. These things are not easy because they exist in these, in these multiple silos. And on a platform, you ha uh, platforms are designed to be integrated to. Uh, software applications actually have incentive, they're incentivized to be somewhat closed because it's, you know, whenever you open up an API, then you've got to support it. Uh, then you've also got to, you're, you're losing a little bit of control, you, there are security holes that open up. Uh, platforms are designed to be integrated to, whether it's integrating to your exchange server with, with Outlook so that when you send an email to a donor, it automatically tracks it in your CRM system, all the way to you need to bring in, uh, you want to bring in data from your front end alum, uh, from your front end website and say, whenever a donor visits any page on our university site, I want to know that information. That's the type of level of integration you can get to by going to a platform, not and beyond, and in addition to that, all of your software applications can speak to each other, or they're actually not separate applications at that point. They're all on a, on a single platform. Uh, one of the other things is that what you may not, how many of you feel like you've done a good job at taking your disparate software systems and have built a platform for getting them to communicate to each other? Has anybody done a good job of that? I, I've seen some that are quite remarkable, to be quite frank. They've done some amazing things. But what you've essentially done is created a platform for data integration. The platforms that exist in the CRM space now are, bring that to the table as part of the out-of-the-box solution. Um, adapt technology as your organization changes. How many of you have ever gone through um, a software implementation and done it one way based on your requirements and by the time you got done with the software implementation your entire business process had changed? 
Okay, I usually get more hands than that. A lot, there's some hands over here a little bit, a little bit hesitant. How, how frustrating is that? Extremely, right? There's nothing more frustrating than, be, than figuring out, putting a business process into place, enabling the technology, and then having your business process change. But that's the reality of the world that we live in. Things change. How rapidly, think about your daily process that you, that you work through. Um, I'll use myself as an example, probably a bad example, but I wake up in the morning and my phone is you know, on the nightstand, and what's the first thing we do? Grab our phones, check email, check social media, right? Did that happen seven, eight years ago? Not at all. Our daily processes have changed so dramatically. Why should we be surprised that our business processes change dramatically and rapidly? Platforms allow you to shift your solution without having to go through full software, full-blown software implementations or purchases of new software. Instead, you can, adapt, you can have your platform help you adapt those new business processes in an environment that you've already created and you're not left chucking everything that you've done and starting over. And then finally, uh, and this is, a, this is a fairly limited list of benefits, there are more than, than are listed here, but the next thing is you can reduce costs and you also have the option of hosting. Now I know to a lot of organizations the cloud or hosted is, is still a bad word, um, and that's fine. Uh, the platforms still, uh, there are platforms that allow you to host, on, to run your own, uh, so your own infrastructure and your own uh, server farms, but you can reduce costs not just by having the hosting option, but you reduce costs by gaining economies of scale by having all of your software systems on a single platform. Your licensing goes way down because you've, you've got your li you're buying a license for a platform instead of individual software applications. And in addition to that, because you're enabling the end user with more, uh, with the ability to perform more functions, then your development team, uh, or excuse me, your uh, inside technology team is less bogged down with requests of things that, because the end users can now do some of those things. So there, there's a lot of uh, cost, cost reduction to be gained there. Okay, so how do we evolve uh, from databases to fundraising solutions? Let me ask you this. How many of you feel like your current donor and alumni management system actually helps you do a better job raising money? Okay, less than half of the hands went up. How many of you feel that that's just a fundamentally major problem in the industry? Okay, every hand should have gone up, right? Your, your system should help you raise more money. So how many of you feel like your donor and alumni management system today is simply a database, a, a repository for information and names? It doesn't provide value back to you, okay? See a lot of that as well. Okay, the, the, one of the things I, I try to explain to people is there, there's an opportunity to get beyond being just a database and developing a true fundraising solution. What are the distinctions? A database is focused on inputs. How many of you feel like your donor management system today is based on inputs and, and not focused on outputs? Okay, I, I would tend to agree with most of you. Um, the fund, a fundraising solution has as its primary focus is delivering outputs that are intelligent, that allow you to make intelligent decisions, uh, perform the right task, uh, recommend, it makes recommendations of things that need to be done, and it allows you to ultimately raise more money. So does anybody, can anybody look at these, uh, in these inputs here and tell me what the output's going to be? Yeah, okay, so most people are able to look at that and say, okay, I can tell by those inputs that it's gonna be cherry pie. So, but hold that thought for a minute. Um, apparently my animations decided, decided to stop working. Uh, here are some quick, quick thoughts on uh, inputs versus outputs. Uh, a, a, an input might be, on that first bullet point, what donors might be interested in an upcoming event. Okay, the input would be, you need to go into the system and put the events that your donors are attending. Instead, the system should be recommending to you the events that your donors should be attending based on the data that you have. Uh, what about, uh, in my next annual campaign, how can I make an ask more clearly rooted in linkage data? How many of you feel like you can go to your database today and uh, answer that question? Okay, a couple. The system shouldn't, you shouldn't have to go to the system and ask that question. A system should be 
producing outputs that answer those questions for you. Now there's a lot, there are a lot of inputs that are required to deliver those outputs, but the, the, the key function here is that you're shifting the system from being focused on taking data from you and you being a slave to the database to the system is providing data back out to you that can be used and is actionable without having to you know, run complicated queries and, and do complicated work to get that data back out. So let's go to the, back to the cherry pie example. Here's a, what a focus on <clears throat> output should deliver. One is more funds raised. I, I present to you or I propose to you that if your donor management solution is not helping you raise more money, then you need to figure out what you need to do to get a donor management system that helps you raise more money. Because if you're not raising more money, then it's all, it's all a waste. You can go back to legal pads and spreadsheets. Or maybe stay on legal pads and spreadsheets. Anybody legal pads and spreadsheets still? Okay, good. <laughs> Second is you become more efficient in your work. Uh, we'll, we'll see this in a minute. What time do we need to, f what's the? 1050, okay. Um, I'll, I'll quickly go through these so I can show you. Your, uh, a, a good donor management system should provide tasks to you and present you with the next thing that you should be working on, regardless of your role in the organization to help you become more efficient in your work. There should be transparency to influence and contribution. How many of you uh, hear from researchers or people in the telefund office or people in different groups of your organization that say, I don't know if I'm making a difference or not because I can't see what my overall effect on fundraising is. Does that, how many of you feel, okay, I see heads nodding. Uh, I, I spoke to a researcher once who said, I love my job, but I don't know if I'm making any difference. When the reality was she was making a, tr she's making a tremendous difference. The problem is the data, her work is not being tracked through the system ultimately to see how much she's influencing fundraising. A good platform and a good system focused on outputs creates transparency into the effect that everybody has on the fundraising process at all levels of the organization. The next is there should be a focus on linkage ability and interest. Um, I'm very surprised, well, I, you know, we're, we're here at Drive, the University of Washington has a tool called Michelangelo, which I think is fantastic, and its focus is to help you get more quickly to your linkage ability and interest data. Uh, you know, the, a good donor management system should have done that already. The next is uh, an ever-expanding set of integrated data. How many of you feel like your data, your data set is shrinking? I hear laughs, right? Of course, that's laughable. How many of you find that your, ex your set of data is expanding rapidly? Okay, as social media becomes more open, what, what would happen to your organizations tomorrow if LinkedIn said, hey, we're gonna open up our API. If you wanna go glean information based on email and pull it into your databases, you can take employment, uh, uh, education, all that information back into your databases. It would, it would explode, right? Your linkage ability and interest data would get greater and greater. As that ever-expanding set of data grows, your, um, the importance of having a platform to be able to expand with it becomes vital. If, you, if it takes an act of Congress to get a field added to your database, then you're not gonna be able to handle these changes that are, that are coming. And, and quite frankly, you're already, you'll already be behind. Next, uh, the right proposal, so I have this mantra, and my mantra is that your donor and alumni management system should help you deliver the right proposal to the right donor by the right team at the right time. How many of you can raise your hand today and say, I feel like my donor management software helps me, that does this for me? So we all have work to do. So next is access is vital. Uh, being able to, Access information wherever you are becomes important. Now, there are security concerns in this and you want to make sure that you have a platform that, that allows you to control those security measures. But we live in a day and an age where if you can't access your donor information on your phone before you're walking to an appointment, that, that's sad. It should be much easier than that. Uh, you'll, we'll show in the platform that we've built, we have the ability to integrate to an Outlook client so you can access your donor management data through Outlook, through a mobile app, through uh, the web-based interface, uh, light data entry portals or light portals for users that aren't necessarily full users of your system. How many of you can access your data through Excel? Okay, there's this there's an interesting stat out there that shows that uh, the majority of people who use business intelligence tools use it to build these complicated data models they then download into uh, pivot tables into Excel. It's kind of the dirty little secret in the analytics industry. But you should be able to, why not, why be, why not, 
why have to go through this rigmarole to get to that point? Why, why not just be able to go straight from Excel to your data source and be able to pull it? And then uh, donor uh, and online giving portals. How many of you have figured out how to expose in your online giving portal or some other portal your, uh, uh, give the, your donors the ability to go on and see their giving history, for example? Okay, update contact information, choose communication preferences. Okay, not enough people raise their hand. Those are all things that in this day and age should be, should be much easier. And they can be with a, with a platform. So I'll show you, uh, I'm gonna show you in the last few minutes, I'll give you an overview of the platform or the solution that we've built on the Microsoft platform. Uh, but uh, we, my company, Foundation XRM, we built on the Microsoft platform. We've focused as much as possible on outputs. Now, our solution is is uh, currently being is in development, uh, continued development, and so those outputs are growing rapidly. But our focus is to be not make you a slave to your donor and alumni management system. Instead, to make it serve you. Uh, next is it's integratable, customizable, extensible. I mentioned before uh, we have groups that do things, everything from um, independent study work in their independent study department all the way through to, uh, and donor and alumni management, all the way through to uh, things like managing the PR contacts and ma managing advisory board members within it for curriculum inside the same platform. Uh, and also I put up there affordable. How many of you feel like your donor and alumni management system today is affordable? Hey, two hands, okay. Uh, our, our solution can be hosted or on premise. That is a one distinction between us and Salesforce is that you, if you want to host it on your own infrastructure, you can. Uh, and feel free to come talk to us as you see us throughout the conference. We're happy to talk about it. We love this industry and love this space and we'll, we'd be happy to show you. So real quick, these are the functional areas that, we're, that our solution covers. I'll, and I'll do kind of a quick overview and show you what a platform can look like. Let me go over here real quick to the... So, wow, this is really small screen. Uh, if you're on a normal size monitor in front of you, you don't have these scroll bars and things like that. You have a lot more real estate to work with. But um, the, you'll notice right off the bat that the system is focused on outputs. So this would be a, a sample development officer dashboard. Um, a good platform solution allows you to tailor the experience by role. So if I'm a development officer, this might be my dashboard. But let's say I'm actually a gift entry person. My, get, my dashboard might show the batches that are, and I apologize, the internet's pretty slow in here. Might show me the batches that it ha are, are not yet processed and maybe they're, you know, here's the check or the wire transfer that I'm looking for. If I'm a researcher, you know, I might see a queue of research requests or reports that we've just completed. Or maybe we have a refresh coming on our data that we need to look at. The point is that regardless of your role in the organization, you can have a customized experience that delivers the data to you that's relevant to you when you need it without having to go to separate places. The next thing is visualization. Yeah, so I'll go back. Here's my, I'm a development officer. Uh, terminology, again, I'm, I'm using the term opportunities here. These are major gift proposals that I have to make. As you can see, uh, I have one coming next week and that's why it's at the top of the list. And then I've got a little pipeline report that tells me, hey, you've got that $150,000 ask at the top of your pipeline. It's also the biggest piece of your pie and starts to uh, can prompt you to say, hey, you know, have you finished the actual written proposal? And so you can come in and add a task and say, yeah, I need to add that written proposal. I need to create a task for a written proposal. By the way, when you add a task here, anyone want to guess where it's going to show up? Shows up in your Outlook tasks. If I had an appointment right there, it's going to be on my Outlook uh, calendar. Um, if I send an email to a donor from this solution, it'll actually set, add it to the sent items in my Outlook folder, and I can choose whether to track or not track the responses that come. So those are the types of things where I say we're focusing on outputs as opposed to inputs. The, the goal of the system should be to make, the, make your job easier while collecting data that continues to make your job easier by providing, uh, that, by providing the data back to you in a way that's actionable. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the next thing is you'll notice uh, you, you can actually create what are called, I keep wanting to touch the screen and scroll, that doesn't work. I'm not using my own laptop, so I'm a little bit out of sorts here. Give me just a second. Uh, one of the things that you want to be able to do is allow what are called, uh, allow different views of the system. And I showed you the views for uh, different types of dashboards, but within those individual dashboards, you can create views for uh, individual 
you can create personalized views or system views that are the same for everybody and can be shared. But so let's say, for instance, that I'm a, I'm a development officer and I'm really focused on um, opportunities without new activities the last 30 days. So I've got a bunch of proposals. I want to know the ones that I have no activities for the last 30 days. I can quickly and easily select that and I'll see a list of the people that I need to contact because I've got opportunities open. Uh, and I can create these for myself or I can share them with other development officers or the system administrator can share them with everybody. Um, you know, maybe I have, here's my list of committed expected major gifts. I can go in there and say, hey, who is committed but we still haven't received the check for? Oh, okay, I've got a million dollar check that, or wire transfer that's sitting out there. Maybe I ought to follow up with Ashley Johnson and find out you know, where that check is. What's the expected date? Target of fulfillment is 3-6. Maybe I'm expecting that check, was that Friday? 3-6 Friday. If I've got that check that I, or that wire transfer that's supposed to come on Friday, maybe it's a good idea for me to call Ashley on Tuesday or Wednesday and just say, hey, just making sure everything's still okay and so you can alert gift entry if something changes. The idea is that you can create these, uh, you can create these lists of data that are relevant, actionable, and immediately personalized to the individual who wants to see them. Um, any questions? Sorry, I'm moving very quickly. We're running short on time. Does anybody have any questions? As a Go ahead. Um, when you're focusing on output, that's really, I mean, that, that's great, but it's half the job, getting the information in there. Yeah. It's not all being fed automatically from other places, checks still come in the door and there's a lot of data entry. Is yep. that process, is that sacrificing? No, so in fact, it's the opposite. We've tried to make the data, the data entry process much more simplified and much easier. So I'll give you an example. Here's an example of uh, that one of those major gift opportunities that I opened up. This one is for, uh, we're looking to get uh, a student life building donation from John Donor here. And you can actually create, you'll notice that you have this little section up here. We've allowed to, we've built it so that you can require data to be entered before you can advance into the next stage. Or if you don't want to use that, you don't have to have it. So in this example, I'm not requiring any data to advance in stages. But instead, I'm collecting data that's useful to the development officer as he's going through the process of, of actually cultivating the relationship. But this data is going into the database and when I'm done with this and I change this from prospecting or I move it over to committed awaiting fulfillment, that actually takes all of that data, pushes it to a gift record that then can be weighted to be fulfilled. So the, the gift entry person doesn't have to re-enter all of the data that's already been, that already exists in the system and it collects that data from the prospect, uh, the, the development officer, whatever you want to call him, up front so that it reduces the data entry burden on the back end. And so we've tried to think through those workflow processes and say, how can we reduce data entry across the organization? Because if you reduce data entry, those outputs come. So you're asking, your, your question was, what about the other side? And my point is, it's not the other side. Without those data entry inputs going in, we can't provide the appropriate outputs. Did you have a question? Yeah, it's actually, it's kind of two. It looks like your, your, your foundation platform is using Dynamics CRM. Yeah. And you customize it to, to your products. And the second question is, Compliance. Say again. Is it HIPAA compliant? Yeah. So that on you can build the security roles to do any of that. So are you in a hospital organization? Yeah, so absolutely. So the security roles in the way that they're built in the platform allow you to control permissions across the entire application and across the platform based on role and user. And they can actually inherit those permissions from if you use Active Directory Federated Services in your other systems, you can actually inherit those from that as well. And then you can, uh, you can control the other piece of it on the server side, whether you're using hosted or whether you're using on-premise, depending on what those, those issues are. Uh, if you want to talk about that later, that's a more complicated question that we can address. So have you been involved in any migrations from an existing white box system to this one that was I have. Uh, as you might imagine, data migration is always the biggest challenge in any implementation. Um, I think... Uh, one of, the, one of the most interesting things to me is that the flexibility of the platform can be a blessing and a curse. Because what happens is you have these older systems and they say, well, we do it this way now, so let's create a field and a table to do that. And so it, they're, they're, because the system will allow you to do that, it creates a problem. So you have to make sure that your requirements are really good and that you're focused on all the right things and you're not doing things just because that's the way you've always done them. Uh, and you're, because your data migrations can get really, really complicated if you're just creating the same old system in a new skin. Um, but regardless of this, 
I'll say it this way. The technology on the back end makes data migration a lot easier and makes it a lot smoother. And because it's integratable, you can actually reduce a lot of data entry by taking data from other systems automatically instead of manually. But data migration is and always will be one of the, the biggest challenge in any kind of implementation. And uh, no platform is really going to change that. So give us an example of how you would get large amounts of data, like NCOA updates, into your system. Uh, you, you could either use the web services that come with the solution. Again, it's a Microsoft product, so the web, their web services library is really robust. And that's, that's how we've done it in the implementations that, that I've worked on. And it, 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 you can also go directly to the database if you want to, although that's you know, it's kind of a, it's not recommended as a secondary option, but there, there is, there's no issue in, are you talking about like, if you've got 5, 10, 15 million records you're trying to push in a night or something? Well, yeah, just basically bad data. Yeah, yeah, it would, be, it would be no different than any other system except that you have a huge library of web services available to you now that open up uh, possibilities you didn't have before. Someone had a question over here? In terms of the data migration, um, I, I wouldn't hazard a guess that any solution is going to be less than another in terms of data migration. Um, I don't, I don't think that our solution provides any savings in data migration time. Instead, what it saves is on the configuration and implementation side. So being able to adapt the system to your business processes. They're, they're, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but I haven't seen anything yet that indicates that there's one solution or another that the data migration process is reduced. Because the, most of the work in data migration is in mapping and cleanup, hygiene, um, and, re and retooling data to match the, from the, to take it from the old system to match the new system schema, and you know I, I don't know of any way to streamline that except for you know just having really good people who understand data, and I, I don't think that our solution is going to make any dramatic increases in, in that process. How about the resources that you take? I mean, you take uh, compared to regular, uh, you take ten percent, you know, estimates. How much resources? I mean, it looks for me that it consumes more. I'll, I'll tell you what, come talk to me later and we'll talk through it because it doesn't take less resources. It, it doesn't take more resources, it takes less. How are you, you know, one of the things that we're struggling with our fundraising is it takes so much time to put all that data in. We need to be able to not Really? Has anybody ever heard that before? Right. That's the answer to that question. That's the first answer. The second answer is that you have to provide value back to them in order to get them to see the value of putting the data in the first. I mean, it's this answer to the, it's the other side of the coin as the gentleman in, the, in front of you asked. But you won't have that value out the minute you go live. No, it, it takes... Right, but you, you, can, you can still provide data out, but the more, the more outputs you give to them, they, the more quickly they see the value of putting inputs in. So for example, here's the mobile application. This is going to be really hard to see because my uh, screen's not very bright right now. Um, but I don't know if you can see it or not, but I'm, I have a dashboard here that shows me here are my activities, the tasks that I need to perform, or the phone calls that I need to make, or the phone calls I have made. I've got one that's alerting me it's overdue because it's gone bright red. You know, these are the things that you expose to your development officer and say, you know, when you leave a home and, and you've made a proposal, you go immediately to your tablet or your iPad or even your desktop, whatever, or your, your notebook, you open it up, you add your notes from that session as an activity, you send whatever emails are appropriate, all of that's tracked in the system the second you, the second you hit, hit send. And then the next time, so you, you, the guy told you, hey, I'm going to consider your proposal, give me three weeks. You set yourself a task for three weeks to follow up on the proposal. It's all in the system and then it's going to alert you when you sit at your desk in three weeks. You're going to get a task that pops up that tells you it's due that day or the appointment that you scheduled. So you start to create these outputs and then suddenly the value of input it's become very, very clear. The other side of that is uh, you can make organization, I mean, so, to some extent, you have to, the organization has to buy in, there have to be mandates made. Are we out of time? Sorry, I apologize. Please come talk to me if you have other questions. I'd love to chat.